So the other day I was working in the shop, making some chips, and I got to thinking, where does all this come from? Like straight lines, regular intervals, you know, that kind of stuff. Now I'm no scholar, or professional machinist for that matter, and like you do, I started having a look in the story and history of how we got to where we are today, and it's pretty amazing. It took thousands of years, and the work of people all over the world, and I found a lot of things that surprised me. I think the best way to think it through is to imagine you have nothing, and you start all over again. So let's say you're stranded on a desert island, and one day you decide you know just the thing that'll get you back to civilization, a time machine. I mean, not only do you regret the three-hour boat tour, but you might as well fix all that other stuff, too. As everyone knows, a time machine is made up of lots of complex, precise parts, like the panometric fan and the turbo and cabulator. But it's a desert island. Everything around you is organic shapes. To get started, you need something straight with accurate marked dimensions, a ruler. How would you get there? Where would you even start? Get three reasonably flat pieces of cast iron or granite, and mark them A, B, and C. If you rub A and B together, they'll get flatter, but also run the risk of one becoming concave and the other convex, either just a little bit. The trick comes when you rub B and C together, and then C and A. The only common plane between three or more surfaces has to be one that's practically perfectly flat. This is how you, on remote desert island, with a lot of effort, but no external reference, make a perfectly flat surface from which all the dimensional precision of the modern world comes from. With that flat surface, or surface plate, you can make the rest of the tools you need to create things like squareness, parallelism, flatness, how round something is, and make tools for accurately dividing a circle. Then you can make portable straight edges which are just as flat as your surface plate to transfer that nearly perfect geometry into other machines like lathes or milling machines to make precision parts. Everything precision around you can be traced eventually back to the surface plate. Oh, you don't see the surface plate in, say, your car or phone. But if you follow the chain of tools backwards, it's there. Your phone was made by machines, which got their final precision from straight edges, which in turn got their precision from the surface plate. It's like bricks in a building. All bricks are relative to the first one that was laid. So it is with tools in the machine shop to the surface plate. They're in every machine shop and factory throughout the world, and they are regularly inspected, resurfaced when necessary, and certified to attest to their accuracy and serve as the final authority and foundation for precision surfaces. Mine came from the Alameda Naval Air Base, where it was in the machine shop that rebuilt jet engines from at least the mid-60s until the base closed in 1997. It's old and beat up, but it's good enough for me, and I think the history is pretty cool. So now we have a perfectly flat surface. But what a surface plate can't do for you, though, is give a unit distance of measure, something like the regular marks on a ruler. This has to be an arbitrary amount, and historically the differences between the next town or parish over had plagued trade and commerce for millennia. France at the time of the French Revolution was estimated to have over 250,000 units of weights and measure throughout the country, and that was a problem in no way unique to France. So with your surface plate, you can make a straight edge to start a ruler. But now you have to mark it at regular intervals. What unit do you use? Where does that unit come from? Could you accurately recreate those marks if you lost your ruler? Since history was first recorded, units of measurement have been taken from nature, often the human body. A cubit was elbow to fingertips, the inch was the width of a thumb, and the span was taken from the hand. Edward I of England declared that three barleycorns, dry and round, make an inch. 
don't laugh about using barley corns for measurement. U.S. and British shoe sizes are still measured in barley corns to this day. The obvious problem is your barley corns might be a different size than mine, or mine might even dry out and change over time. Though for a long time, that was good enough. But eventually, a more accurate and universally accepted measurement system was needed. The dream has always been to find a natural measurement that was uniform everywhere, that anyone could reproduce at high accuracy. So in 1824, England created a standard yard based on a pendulum length beating seconds in London at sea level in a vacuum. Thus being a natural measurement, it could be recreated if lost or destroyed. And in 1834, it was destroyed in a fire when Parliament burned. Problem was the calculations used to create it were found to be erroneous. And by then it was well understood that gravity is not geographically uniform and that standard was abandoned. Thankfully, copies of the previous 1760 yard were still available, and from those, a new standard was made to which all measurements were standardized all the way until the Weights and Measurements Act of 1963. Remember what I said about France having hundreds of thousands of measurements? In the 1790s, the French had been working to sort the whole mess out, what would become the metric system. They too wanted it based on a natural system that anybody could reproduce. The measurement of one ten millionth of the Earth between the North Pole and the equator, and they would call it the meter. It wasn't just measurement they were trying to make decibel. The 360 degree circle inherited from the ancient Babylonians became 400 degrees. The meter in the 400 degree circle would make calculations far easier and synchronize astronomy and navigation. 100 kilometers would be one degree of latitude on an Earth 40 million meters in circumference. So getting the length of the meter right was incredibly important as so many other measures derived directly from it. For example, one milliliter of water is one cubic centimeter, weighs one gram, and requires one calorie of heat to raise its temperature one degree centigrade, which is a 1% difference between freezing and boiling. The amount of hydrogen weighing the same amount has exactly one mole of atoms in it. By comparison, in the American system, the answer to how much energy does it take to boil a room temperature gallon of water is go fly a kite. To get the measurement needed for the meter, in the early 1790s, the French Academy of Sciences charged two men, two of the top astronomers of their time but also very familiar with surveying, to plot the meridian distance from Dunkirk through Paris to Barcelona. The remainder of the distance to the equator and North Pole would be extrapolated. Originally the mission was supposed to take less than a year. However, after some delays, when the expedition was finally underway, the country was convulsing from the French Revolution and everything was a mess to say the least. Instead of a year or less, it took six years to determine that single number, and it's truly an amazing story. Nearly everything that possibly could go wrong did. Even with all their hard work, a tiny error was introduced that we still live with today. The story of that expedition and methods is so amazing, it deserves its own video, and that'll come later. With the measurement finally done, in 1799, the French legislated the meter as the official standard though France had a rocky on-again, off-again relationship with it until 1875, when an international convention made the standard across several countries. Official bars were sent to countries to serve as their reference. The U.S. received what is called the number 27 National Prototype Meter Bar, made of platinum, with a touch of uridium, in an X-shape to keep maximal dimensional stability. Speaking of which, getting back to freedom units, in 1866, the U.S. Geographic Survey stated that thereafter the U.S. inch was equal to just a tiny fraction of a hair over 25.4 millimeters. Starting in 1893, all the way until 1960, every calibrated device made in the U.S., intermetric, from the most sensitive scientific instruments to school children's rulers, were all traceable back to that number 27 meter bar sitting in Washington, D.C. It was at that moment. Over 150 years ago in 1866, the
the U.S. inch was linked to the meter, and every time in later years the meter was further refined, so was the inch with it. But in the late 1800s, the English imperial yard was such that one inch equaled a fraction of a hair under 25.4 millimeters. Even worse, compared to the meter, the English yard artifact was slowly shrinking. So having your flat surface, and now agreed upon international standard, is useless unless you can actually get it into the hands of the people manufacturing high precision products. And that's exactly the situation a Swede named Carl Edvard Johansson found himself in. He was inspection chief at a Swedish factory making American and German guns on license. But when they started making a new gun, there was no way for him to quickly make new gauges, the tools to quickly check the size of machined items. In this footage from a World War I UK munitions plant, notice she's checking the dimension with gauges of a fixed size. The obvious problems that they're going to wear, be difficult to adjust, and not super precise. What was needed was a system where the gauges could be adjusted, but even more importantly, checked and set correctly at regular intervals. And that's what Johansson invented. Notice now the gauges are adjustable, but even more profound and far-reaching was the system used to set and check them. For that, Johansson invented a set of very precisely made metal blocks, sized such that they could be combined together to make many, many thousands of dimensions quickly and accurately. In doing so, he made a universal measuring system that underpins the industrial world today. He made his first gauge block set in 1896 with the help of his wife's sewing machine to carefully lap the very hard steel blocks. His first sets were so expensive they cost more than his annual salary at the gun factory. In 1914, a set cost about $21,000 in today's money and were accurate to three millionths of an inch. Making the block so they kept dimensional stability at that accuracy proved very difficult, and Johansson had to experiment with many different kinds of steel, but also cycles of freezing and heating and letting them sit for many months before finally being lapped to final dimension. The entire process takes about a year. At the outbreak of World War I, the U.S. War Department declared Johansson's blocks as the standard of measurement for all war material. However, the German submarine blockade of neutral Sweden caused near panic when additional gauge block sets were not available. The chief of the U.S. Bureau of Standards was able to get Johansson's U.S. sales manager released from army duty and sent to Sweden. He stayed there until he was able to get 128 sets made and successfully smuggled them past the German inspectors back to the U.S. The beautiful small city of Eskostuna, Sweden, is famous for steel and machine tools. Near its historic main square are factories with products requiring the finest craftsmanship. Here, over 300 years ago, Sweden's toolmaking had its origin. And in this ancient town, world industry was revolutionized a half century ago by incredibly accurate products of the Johansson factory. At the foundries of Sandviken, molten metal is transmuted into the finest steel, writhing like giant serpents. At the Johansson plant, fully processed steel bars of all required dimensions move from vast storerooms to machines, cutting them into proper lengths for milling. Here, master machinists shape blocks of steel that made modern industrial science possible, for they are the world's standard engineering measure the unbelievably precise Johansson gauge blocks. These operations may appear quite simple, but the cutting and polishing procedures demand utmost skill. The creation of perfect flat planes of steel is one of the greatest achievements of industrial science. Each gauge block must pass rigid spectroscopic tests and be completely perfect, for it is the final authority in all highly accurate measurements. This device, developed by the company's founder, detects an error of one twenty-five millionths of an inch in these blocks which check accuracy of gauges, making high-precision mass production possible. Now, engineer Johansson demonstrates an amazing property of these blocks, first ringing several together. Although non-magnetic, they adhere. 
He attaches top and bottom blocks to cables of the tensile strength tester, which indicates their remarkable cohesion, possibly the result of molecular attraction. The blocks cannot be forced apart, even with a tensile pull of 120 kilos or 570 pounds per square inch. Only with such amazingly fine measuring units could our modern machine age come into being. Gates blocks in various combinations are exceedingly sensitive to temperature changes. Here a cylindrical gauge is being tested. Now the gauge is slightly warm, with this result. This matched set may seem hardly more impressive than a box of children's blocks. But with them, we have built our complex industrial world. Endless combinations provide all needed dimensions. Gauges of all types everywhere are tested with these blocks produced in a little Swedish town where half a century ago, modern industrial science was born. In the economic depression that followed the war, Johansson was about to go out of business. So he contacted Henry Ford who promptly bought the company. Ford and Johansson were fast friends. Only Ford's son Etzel and Johansson were allowed into Ford's office without knocking. In Ford's 1931 book, Moving Forward, there's a whole chapter on Johansson's blocks. Ford writes, Before Johansson's blocks, they pretty much didn't know what an inch was, but now could calibrate and check their gauges off multiple times a shift, and could consistently maintain three ten thousandths of an inch accuracy on critical parts. This greatly increased production and profitability. Click on the link to read that chapter. Starting in 1923, Johansson and Ford co-branded gauge blocks were sold in a heavy Bakelite box. Here's a period brochure detailing the different options and grades. When new, the A-grade set cost about $5,500 in today's money. The 81 block set is said to be able to make over 100,000 combinations, but I can't find a precise number mentioned anywhere. And that really annoys me. But more on that later. Production reached its peak during World War II, when Ford was shipping 200 sets a week. Ford had ensured the U.S. would never be short on gauge blocks again, and companies all over the United States involved in the war effort were buying them as fast as he could make them. And you know what? The blocks have an amazing property. If you carefully slide, or ring them together, they'll actually stick together on the very precision lap sides. Is it because of intermolecular forces? Cold welding where the electrons are crossing between the blocks? Or maybe because the atmosphere is crushing down on them and all the air is squeezed out? Or, I, I don't know. The debate rages on, and no one seems to know for sure, but it's probably a combination. The problem with different inch standards became a real issue in World War II, when the inch-based countries discovered their parts were not truly interchangeable, as there was at least three different standards for the inch. Following the war in 1951, the Canadians sensibly legislated that one inch was equal to 25.4 millimeters exactly, and shortly after, the US and UK followed suit. But Johansson had beat them all to it. He had split the difference between the US and English standards, and set one inch to exactly 25.4 millimeters long ago in 1923 when he started working with Ford. He had effectively already shifted over entire industries which were using his blocks as their definitive basis of measurement to what was then called the industrial inch. I'm going to let that sink in for a moment. The U.S. inch is not only based on the meter, but effectively a guy from Sweden that determined by how much. Gauge blocks have innumerable uses around the shop, but one important one is to regularly check your micrometers. Though not as accurate as gauge blocks, micrometers are the most frequently used measuring device. If there's a difference between your micrometer and gauge blocks, trust the gauge blocks. Attesting to the importance of gauge blocks today, there are many manufacturers, but they are still widely called Joe blocks, in honor of Johansson, no matter who is making them.
The final piece is traceability. Here in the U.S. we have NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It serves the authority for all weights, measures, and more. Other countries have their own equivalents. NIST will, for a stiff fee, test and certify your measuring devices to meet extremely exacting standards and record the precise deviation. In a factory or laboratory, you'll see certifications on measuring devices which are not checked directly by NIST, but rather checked locally and are part of an unbroken, verifiable chain leading back to NIST. Many shops will have a very high quality master set of gauge blocks that are only used to verify the precision of the other gauge blocks, which in turn then check everything else. One of the wonders of our time is you can buy a new set of gauge blocks which are NIST traceable for under $100. Remember the first sets cost more than Johansson's yearly salary. Everyone can have measurement accurate to a few millionths of an inch for almost nothing. The implications of these four things, the surface plate as the foundational dimensional reference, the meter, a unit of distance measure that everyone has agreed on, gauge blocks to put those units of measure into people's hands at high precision, and a government body to serve as the ultimate authority for those measures is incredibly profound. Everything in the modern world around you which is made in an industrial way, even pretzels, completely depends on those preconditions. It's this repeatable precision down to tiny fractions of an inch that gives us our modern interchangeable world. It's not just that we have that level of precision, but that it's also incredibly cheap and ubiquitous. Objects that demand precision like clocks or astronomical instruments were once owned only by royalty or the extremely wealthy, but now something like the ballpoint pen which requires incredible precision can be bought for pennies. And it's not just the pens but the entire web of precision, like the trucks that deliver them, or the computers which processed and tracked the order, and then everything else again which in turn makes the trucks and computers possible and so on. Millions of things need to go right consistently in order to deliver a pen to your desktop for 14 cents a piece. Which brings us to the first machine thinking project, the James Watt Micrometer. Watt is best known for his improvements to the steam engine, but he invented many other things, including the U-shaped micrometer, which is found in every machine shop today. He built his micrometer around 1772, likely based on a friend's astronomical instrument for measuring the width of stars and the angular distance between them. As a prolific inventor and mechanical engineer, he was in desperate need of precision, a world that had very little of it. Although Watt had trained as an instrument maker and was no stranger to what was precision work for the day, not even the surface plate had been invented yet. Remember that desert island? That's sort of the situation Watt found himself in. While there are some amazing precision-ish objects created by craftsmen of his time and before, everyone was on their own island, often surrounded with much secrecy, working to their own standards. Watt's inch was his own, and his micrometer wasn't even based on a decimal system. He didn't make his micrometer publicly known, and it's kind of like a spaceship that landed a hundred years before it was reinvented by a Frenchman who then sold the patent to Brown and Sharp, and now they're everywhere precision is needed. In the next video, we'll go into more detail about Watt's micrometer, his design choices, and thoughts around how I'm making it. I've only scratched the surface of the history and science of measurement, or more properly known as dimensional metrology. We have evidence of humans trying to crack this problem for thousands of years, and it's a fascinating subject. I'll link to more resources on my website. I'm starting the first project with precision, because it's what all other projects will be based on, and it's so foundational to machining. Precision isn't an accident, and is the result of an amazing amount of work and investment over hundreds of years to get us to where we are today. The milling machines, lathes, measuring devices, and other tools we use in the home shop are direct descendants of the work of countless people who came before us. What a privilege to stand on the shoulders of so many men and women such that we, too, can quickly and easily make precision parts which we know are to the same standards as others anywhere. Even in the most modest home shop, precision is cheap, and I hope you've found this small part of the story as fascinating as I have. I hope you'll join with me in future videos as I explore the techniques, machines, history, and the impact on us over many future projects to come. I can't wait to get started. I'll see you next time. My favorite book on the subject of metrology is The Foundations of Mechanical Accuracy by Wayne Moore, son of Richard Moore, founder of the Moore Special Tool Company. 
More tools are known for their incredible accuracy and insane lengths the company went to to build their machines. Their jig boring and grinding machines are very famous and I'm sorry to say I've never had a chance to use one or even seen one in person. Richard Moore is credited with adding an extra decimal place to precision manufacturing, a feat I'm not sure anyone else can claim. So I emailed the Moore Tool Company and asked exactly, you know, which decimal place are we talking about here? And I'm still waiting on an answer. Wayne's 1970 book is essentially a very elaborate sales brochure for their universal measuring machine, thoroughly showing how they built their machines, control for quality every step of the way, and steps for maintaining a millionth of an inch in accuracy. But it's a lot more than that, too. Having extensive documentation on all the pitfalls, setups, and techniques needed for ultra-precise measurement and manufacturing, even down to how they had very elaborate temperature controls and worked hard to keep even human body heat away from castings weighing tons. There's also sections on measurement history, and this book served as one of the inspirations and sources for this video. If you like guys in brill cream and horn brim glasses getting super nerdy with precision, I can't recommend this book enough. If you look on eBay or Amazon, people are asking crazy prices for used editions though, but you can still buy it directly from the Moore Company brand new at far lower prices. It's still spendy, but a worthy addition to your bookshelf. Over 350 pages with over 550 photographs is well worth the price of admission. Remember talking about all the possible measurements of Johansson blocks? The standard 81 block set is broken into whole inches along the bottom, one to four inches, then increments of 50 thousandths, from 50 thou up to 950. Above that is the blocks needed to fill in between the 50 thous, with 101 to 149 thou blocks. And then above that, finally the 10 blocks which cover the 10 thousandths between each thousandth. The process for determining which blocks you need usually goes something like this. Let's take the measurement of 3 inches, 976 thousandths, and 2 tenths. Conveniently, this is the example also used on the Sterrett site, so people with other block sets can follow along. First, you want to eliminate the 2 ten thousandths at the end. So you'd select the block that's 100 thou with 2 tenths and subtract that from the total. Now we have 3.876 inches. The thousandths place ends in a 6. So you look at all your thousands blocks which end in 6 and select one which will make the thousands place either a 5 or a 0. In this case, let's select the 126 thou block and subtract that for 3.75 inches even. Now it's a simple matter of adding a 750 thou block and then 3 inches and then we're done. Here's why the claim of over 100,000 possible measurements bugs me. Well that's true, only because they use the weasel word over. I figured pretty much straight away this way underestimates the possibilities. You don't even have to do any real calculations. Because this set allows us to make 10,000 measurements between each inch, just start figuring out how many full inches you can cover. If we add up just our inch blocks, 1, 2, 3, and 4, that's 10 inches. Which means that by combining those inch blocks with the smaller ones, we know right there we can get 10 sets of 10,000 measurements. So that's your 100,000 measurements right there. But here's the kicker, if you add up all the blocks, like stick them all together, they add up to over 26 and a half inches. That tells me, even without doing a single calculation, the possible measurements is way higher than 100,000, since that 10 inches is like two-fifths of the total measurement. Now true, it's only if you've lived a bad life you would ever likely have to stick so many blocks together. Typically it's unusual to make measurements over a couple inches, but we are a nerdy, pedantic people, and knowing the exact number of possible measurements is important for reasons. So I looked into this kind of combinatorial problem, and it's a minor variant on what is known as the 0-1 knapsack problem, which gets into the optimal objects to place in a limited space, like a knapsack. Borrowing some code I found online to solve this problem, I was able to determine the number of measurements you can make with an 81-piece set of Johansson's blocks like mine is 261,535. At least, I'm pretty sure that's the number, which is far, far greater than the number advertised. However, this method produces incredibly unoptimized combinations for which blocks to use for a given measurement. For example, its answer for one inch is not the inch block, but this ridiculous combination. So I wrote my own program with the aim of producing the possible blocks, but optimized for the fewest number. 
Currently, my version is able to find 230,682. It's actually perfect up until about 19 and a half inches when the recursive algorithm I wrote starts to miss measurements the other one finds. So clearly I need to do some tweaking there. By this time you've put together all the inches, all the 50,000 blocks, and started to make tricky combinations of the smattering of blocks that are left over. I'll post on my website the solution I've come up with so far, and once I've had a chance to clean them up, I'll post the code to my solution and the one I found online into my GitHub account. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.